well, passing compliance regulations with care. Um, many of us have had past business experiences with Tom. And we, we, <coughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. And we, uh, we certainly appreciate your sponsorship of our conference. And yeah, it was a real pleasure that John uh, asked us to sponsor the con um, conference. And uh, it's interesting, Ian Dibble has also got herd homes. Both of them have got herd homes. Um, Dame Shipley said, you know, it's, you have to, uh, tech, you have to uh, know what's going on and you've got to accept change. And when you actually look at all this, I was a very good farmer at one stage, and now I'm quite a confused farmer, but during that, uh, once I got the Grasslands Award, um, I had to find a passport, get a passport, went to England. First job over there was to meet up with uh, two New Zealand farm advisors who were running group of um, innovative young farmers up there uh, who wanted to get cows out of barns. So I went up there to support two New Zealand farmers getting cows out of barns. Um, what happened? I had my eyes open. I saw things that I hadn't seen before. They could go through the winter with no pugging, lots of grass, cows in really good order. Later, I had the privilege of going to the States. And what did I learn there? We didn't feed our cows. Our cows didn't grow. So soon after that, I got back and met up with the agri-research guys that I was, uh, had worked with before I got the award and said, A, we need to bring some sort of animal housing into New System, into New Zealand. Not because we wanted to house cows, but because we wanted to grow more grass and grow better animals. So it has nothing to do with the barn. But the barns we saw, both in the States and the UK, uh, in the UK really didn't suit us. And a lot of the emphasis of those barns were for long-term animal housing. So what we needed was something which would be more on the order of free-range chooks. And um, there's a lot of very smart, innovative farmers out there. And some of them actually realise that their cows are very smart and innovative cows too. And if they get hungry, they'll find a way out of a paddock. If they get hot, if they can, they will find shelter or cold. So um, it's probably time I got on to the speech. So what I'm meant to be talking about is bringing all the things together that has worried most farmers, and that is compliance and still making a profit. And it is really all just one. We'll explain it as we go. Which button do we press? Now, I don't know, did any of you get down to see John's cows down there? Did you go there by bus? Yep. Well, this is in the winter time, and uh, those cows are every bit as big and as huge as you'll ever see. The yearlings, equally as good. Absolutely amazing. And you can see there on the track how wet it is, but just through the glimpse above those animals, you can see a green line out there. And the year I was down there, it was probably one of the few green paddocks you could actually see was John's runoff. Uh, it hadn't been knocked around, which was quite a change. And things for a great start. Now, how much did you actually see? Like, if you remember that better compliance equals better profits. So what have you just seen or not seen? First of all, you've seen warm, dry, well-fed stock. No effluent problems, no pugging, no soil, etc. It's a no-brainer. Those cows can go in. Now, in Southland, they're inclined to be locked in, but in most of the country, where they can achieve the same results by letting, leaving the gates open and giving the cows to access, to access their own food every day from a paddock, because if the paddock's too wet, the cows aren't going to lie down there. They're not going to mob in a corner of a paddock when they can go back to something warm and dry. So it's quite a different way of thinking, but it actually goes hand in hand because if the cows aren't there stirring things up, you don't have a problem. And this sort of explains it. So you have a, an animal barn in the middle, a flexible animal barn, something that cows can go to any day. You don't have to stop and set it up. You don't have to make sure the bedding's right or the straw's right or anything. It's just got to be a really simple system. And with that, you'll end up protecting the soil uh, the mob stocking, you won't get sediment running off the farm. One of the big problems we have in New Zealand, unlike I've been in England, when we get rain, occasionally when we get rain, some years we get rain, 
it absolutely buckets down and it will wash the soil particles off, off the paddocks. And it's one of our biggest problems of nutrient le leaching is actually soil particles and getting into lakes like Lake Ellesmere and others. So by cows actually removing themselves and leaving a, a grass base, it actually fixes one of our biggest environmental problems in New Zealand. It also solves a lot of the nutrient leaching problems. So how do you choose your barn? What do you know about barn? Why would you actually get a barn that Tom? Actually, I'm not a Tom. That was a bit of a lie. I'm actually Thomas. I'm a doubting Thomas. I'm a farmer. So therefore, barns designed by us, which is now a large team of people, experts, we actually have them in the UK, we actually have uh, one in Australia, and we're right through New Zealand. Um, they had to meet all sorts of standards, and because I didn't have a history of barn buildings, we could actually go to the best engineers, best barn builders, the effluent people to look at what we needed to do. So it's a completely different type of barn than you'll see anywhere else. And while you're doing that as a farmer, and I know all the farmers in this room would be passionate about their stock, you're not going to set up something which is not going to meet welfare standards. So you already put the welfare standards in before you even start. So you've got no welfare compliance to worry about. Um, and that's basically we've run through all that. We'll just keep going. The next part is if you're going to do anything on your farm, including get out of bed to go outside the door other than to say hello to your animals, you're certainly going to aim at making a profit. Now, the warmer you can keep your cows in the wintertime, or in the summertime at the moment, we run them, it has a vent system on the top, automatic. As the sun comes in, it warms up a solar layer just above the head of the animals, so it cools the cows. If you can keep your cows in their comfort zone, everything they eat, whether it's a beef or a dairy farm, will actually come out as profit or more produce. So it's very, very simple. Did you know if you actually fed New Zealand cows, if, if all New Zealand farmers fed their cows to 80% of what those cows require to eat for a whole season, at the moment, New Zealand government statistics on it, we're feeding them 70% of what their live weight requires. We're all grass feeding, so if there's no grass, they don't get fed. So if you average it over a whole year, we're pretty bad. 70% is pretty bad. 80% are still starving your cows for a lot of the year. But anybody got any idea what that's worth to the New Zealand economy on an annual basis? Same number of cows, same number of hectares. It's worth $1.7 billion to New Zealand's economy. Um, effluent. Now, the other thing I didn't like about the barns, I saw, not being rude, but in the States or in the UK, was the smell and the odours and things like that. And everybody had come away of overcoming the smells and the odours, but what I realised is the smell and the odour actually comes from the effluent, mainly, can come a bit from the feed, but the majority is in the effluent. Now, if you can smell it, you're actually losing what farmers have just bought. You might have bought it in food, but you've bought nutrients for your farm. So if you can walk into your barn and actually smell it going up into the air, somebody's got something wrong. And the healthier you can keep the air, the healthier you'll keep your cows. Part three, what's the use of, of choosing a great stock barn and working out what compliance you've got to meet and not making any money out of it? You're going to have to change things and that's what Dame Jenny was talking about and that's what you heard um, from this panel too, was changing things. So if you've got a new toy, you're certainly going to play with it. So you've got to look at every stage of your farm, what you're doing. You've got to work out what those cows want all the time, what the paddock wants all the time, what the soil structure requires, what you're going to do with that effluent. And like even the situation where we're moving beef animals further onto hills, most of them still have flat paddocks. And one thing I learned in Devon, which came through really strongly, was we in New Zealand talk about effluent as a liquid effluent that comes out of our milking sheds or milking parlours. It's liquid. In the UK, it doesn't have a lot of value, but if they talk about muck as money or muck as brass, they're talking about good shit, stuff that you can just about pick up in your hand. It's solid. Now, where does that go in Devon? 
it goes back to their flat paddocks and it goes back there every year and they've been growing the same crops off those lands for 40, for 400 odd years. In New Zealand, what do we do with it? We water it down and we used to send it down the river, but now we're not allowed to, so we try to irrigate it and we build bigger ponds and we catch more rainwater and it, it's just a disaster. Where the English had the answer, well, you would know <laughs> uh, a long time ago. So this is um, one of the observations we made. On the left, well, on your uh, left there, uh, that's the herd home with the thermal layer in. Now, you'll see another shot of it, but it, will, it has the electronic vent on the top, which you actually can see there. And the shade cloth, what happens, the sun comes through the clear light. It physically heats up this area, just above the cow's head. And from that area, the hot, go, hot air goes out and it starts thermal convection. So it's, this thing's a little bit out of control at the moment. Uh, so am I. But... Um, the other one is the American barn, and what I noticed with the American barns is they used to have a high-pitched roof well above, and they would use, try to use fans to drive that air back down again, because they realise you see a lot of barn statistics, and statistics, sati what is it, the, the saying? Statistics, statistics, damn statistics. American barns can explain exactly how much air they're losing out of their barns. Do they actually, actually talk how much of that natural airflow is passing over the head of the cow? It's nowhere near the head of the cow. It can be 20, 30 feet up in the air. Um, what we want is we have to put that matting right through at cow height so that every hot spot needs new air. So it drives the same amount of wind through the cows with no cost. Um, shading is critically important. We have a variety of these sorts of things. Now the other thing too is, and we talked about this, well, we, I heard this again today, not every farmer requires the same thing all the time. So in this system, we can actually run water into the stored effluent and liquidise it. Or we can have it dry stored, or we can have a scraped system. And the dry, we can get it up to just on 30% dry matter with no mechanical intervention at all. These are just choices. Okay, most farmers don't like to throw anything away, but if you look at that old barn there, you probably think, wow. Actually, the farmer that built that was the first person that built one of our herd homes quite a few years later, but it, it was built about 30 years ago. He's a stubborn old boy, great guy, really enjoy him. He's in Kumu. When, I, when he built the first herd home down there 10 years ago, he was the last three farms in the middle of Auckland. He is now the last two. Um, and um, he said to me, look, I, I've got this old shed, what are we going to do with it? And I said, well, it's quite obvious, you either pull it down or we, uh, he wasn't keen on that, he had, it was his pet, he built it, so we re-roofed it, and we've given him, it's not just natural light and getting light in there, but light is so critically important to stock health. It is partly to do with uh, vitamin D, which actually then will affect vitamin A and cause rickets and all sorts of things. It's partly to do with that. But the main reason why we want clear light in the barn most of the year round is to kill bacteria. So it's clear light will kill bacteria. And it'll also, then you've got a symmetrical roof and we've got a lot of airflow technology gone in there, which actually moves air over the floor, which dries the floor, also restricting bacteria to breed. Right, so one of the problems that we've seen, and we see it with our own clients, is a lot of them will actually build a barn and then think, well, how are we going to use it? And a lot of them love it for the time of the year they build it for. One of the first we built in the Waikato was purely for cooling his big pedigree cows in the middle of summer. Um, he was really reluctant to use in the winter time. Then we have others like John, who would use theirs flat out during the winter, but I doubt if they would ever go in there during the summer. Do they if it snows? <laughs> yeah, they have a good summer down there. <laughs> so it's a matter of having a facility which is flexible and actually the cows know where it is. We, um, the first, we've had 16 model changes since in 10 years of building herd homes. And the first two original ones on my farm just south of Wangarei, not far from here. 
we got concrete cutters in because we were going to change the end and the way we emptied it. And it was a beautiful day just coming up to Christmas. And at nine o'clock, the concrete cutter came, and about half past nine, ten o'clock, he had knocked out the end wall and, and uh, flattened all the gates. And we got a deluge that I would die for at the moment. We just had rain galore coming down, electrical storm. What happened? 360 cows broke their paddock gate down to run back to home, the big sooks. And all we had was concrete gutter, cutters, and it was, it was very entertaining. I went out later. So this is another thing that we've just started on. Um, the cost of entry for a lot of farmers is high. So this is a compressed soft rock floor. And you think of your farm lanes or your farm tracks. In the summertime, they will cope well. If they get wet, they will start to break down. Now this, we can run two mobs of stock through all winter, and we get no floor deterioration. And that is going back to what I was talking about before, getting the airflow right, getting the drying right. The only trouble in this system is the effluent is on the floor. It has to be scraped off daily. And because it's drying, you're losing sulfur and you're losing your nitrogen out of it. But it is a dry product and very easy to store. Right, just a bit of a breather. And we'll, um, how much time have we got? Cool. So why do... Why do people own farmland? My reason for that is to enjoy livestock and through them convert grass crop to money. That is great farming. That's what I want it to be. Now, really interesting. At the moment, we are, well, I'm finding it interesting. You're probably finding it pretty boring, actually. But um, right at the moment, we're going through some refinancing with banks, and they want to know how you got on. So 2001, I sat down with engineers uh, concrete manufacturing engineers, pre-stress concrete engineers, agri-search scientists, and I said I want to build a barn and we're not going to put any electricity in, it's going to keep cows cool, it's going to keep them warm, it's going to have no odour effluent, it's going to be magical. And they sort of laughed and said it wasn't going to happen. And believe me or not, it didn't happen on the first few models either. But we, we're getting pretty close to where I wanted to be. Um, the bank managers now look at us and sort of say, well, that's all very good, but what's it actually done for you? Well, back in 2002 to 2004, our cost of production of milk, milk solids, I can't convert it for those that are in pounds, but um, it was about $1.86. That's not including labour and not including a feed bill. What is it today? We're doing... Um, just on 70% more production now on my four farms than what I was in 2002 to 2004. Cost of production. Anybody want to take a stab? It's been a decade. Ooh, you're all chicken. <laughs> we're um, one cent cheaper, so we're $1.56 or something at the moment, our cost of production. Because basically our land masses state stayed the same, but we're doing an awful lot more production. So same cow shed, same number of cows. It's just what I went back to before. Most New Zealand farmers are underfeeding their, their own cows. We're damaging our land, so we're not growing the grass that we should. It comes down to this. If you have healthy soils and well-managed pasture, well, one thing, once you soil's wet, you can't put cows on it because you're going to have compacted soils and poorly managed pasture. You're going to have fully fed, contented cows, and most of that is going to be grass-based. So market opportunities. Once you've got free-range cows, effectively is what it is, the market opportunity is huge because these aren't house cows, and they're not locked outside in lousy weather. There's a huge market for this. It will maximise profits because the cost of running it is cheaper. So happy farmer, happy wife, or does it go the other way around? If the wife's happy, the farmer is too. Um, so what can interrupt this? Right, when is it time to let old technologies go? Like you look at the poor donkey who's been flipped over backwards with that cart. Would neck weights actually help? Would a smart idea actually help our industry? No, one silver bullet for the industry is not actually going to help. It's going to take many of these. And really what we're talking about is a whole package. And it is actually the system. Once you've got a barn that's suitable, 
then it's changing that entire system. And the system is there, and man, do we still struggle, although we've got over 300 clients and we get a huge amount of client support, we get a lot of individual research support, but do you think we can get the large um, corporate bodies and companies and research stations to publicly acknowledge it? This is a real thorn. New Zealand is grass-fed cows. So to actually say we're going to have grass-fed cows with access to barn is a very big step, and not often can you get everybody to take that step. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Right, question time. We've got time for a few questions. Welcome, Barry. Thanks for Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back in the uh, land of the All Blacks. Um, normally, at a conference like this, I, I like to start off with a bit of a story. And uh, when I'm talking at conferences in Australia, I always preface the, the part I'm about to do by asking, is there, is there an Englishman in the audience? Now, obviously, we have Englishmen and English people in the audience today, so just bear with me a little bit. But it's a story about an Englishman who was very, very talented man, but he... he used to get very nervous before he went for a job interview and he found this job up in Scotland that he thought he was fitted for. So we went up to Glasgow and he worked out what he'd have to do was his appointment was straight after lunch so he'd find somewhere to sit down and have his lunch, read his all the bio of the position etc and then go straight for the interview. So he walked around Glasgow and eventually found this little side lane, he looked down, he was a restaurant site so he walked into the restaurant, thought he was going to have peace and quiet and looked around, there's only one other person in the restaurant. So being an Englishman, he had to be polite. So he walked up, got up and walked over to this fellow and said, hey now, is your name Richard Fitzfarthing White? He said, do you mind if I sit here? And the little fellow's eating, he said, no. So he sat down, didn't say another word. And the Englishman said, well, what's your name? He said, Mark. Mac. Hey, Mark. No, 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 no. He said, must be McNair, McNab, no, Mark. No, come on. Look, he said, and put his knife and fork down. He said, look. He said, my name's Mark. He said, I'll tell you the story of my life and then you'll piss off and let me eat my meal in peace. He said, I was born Angus McDoodle in a village north of Perth. He said, my father was a crofter and didn't have a lot of money. He said, but I had a terrible intensive desire to be a doctor. So he said, I studied terrible hard at school. I got a scholarship to Glasgow University where I studied hard for three years and I graduated as a doctor. So McDoodle, MD. He said, I couldn't get a job in Scotland or England or Wales, so I had to go to Africa. And I saw all the terrible suffering in that continent. So he said, I come back to an ecclesiastical bend and study from a daughter of divinity. And he said, four years later, I graduated. So I was McDougal, with MD and DD. He said, then we went to Paris one weekend and he said, the blood ran to my loins and I contracted a social disease. So I was McDougal with MD and DD, but I had VD. He said, and he said, the dean of divinity just threw up a little man and took away my DD. So I was McDougal with an MD, but no DD, but I still had the VD. He said, the VD got worse and my doodle dropped off. Just, <laughs> now I'm just Mark. <laughs> anyway. All right. All right, back to cattle, back to cattle. Yeah, so actually as I was sort of packing to come over, I uh, threw a few things in the bag. One of them was this, this uh, tie from the 2007 Rugby World Cup. And on that pretty much as... Every country represented with short on, so I figure if the cattle job gets a bit heavy tonight, we can talk rugby and we've got a, some stuff to auction for Richie McGore anyway. Look, I'm, I've really looked forward to this since Bill and Judy asked me about this talk. I mean, I don't know if you're going to enjoy it, but to me, it doesn't seem a lot of point in people literally travelling around the world to come somewhere and be all hail fellow, well met, but actually not get down to core issues within the breed. So that's what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes. And if anyone would like to talk to me after, I'd appreciate it. So and what I really want to do is, is actually issue you a challenge. It was been interesting this morning listening to Dame Jenny and the other speakers. We've all alluded to the internet, just how important it is. So to a certain degree, you're already warmed up for what I'm going to be talking to you about. But what I'd like to do is issue you with a challenge. And the challenge comes from a, a book written by T.E. Lawrence or Lawrence of Arabia called Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And in that book, he wrote that all men dream, but not equally. For the dreamers of the night awoken to find it was merely their vanity. But the dreamers of the day are the dangerous ones, for they dream with their eyes open and they make things happen. 
And that's my challenge to, to you and to myself and to others in the shorthorn breed is to become dreamers of the day and make things happen. Because I guess the thing that I find personally so frustrating with shorthorns is the product is so bloody good. If we had a crap breed of cattle, you can put all the spin on it you like, you're not going anywhere. But we have a top breed of cattle, have been a top breed of cattle for 200 odd years. And, and I, as I said the other day at our shorthorn board meeting in Australia, I think the thing we have to change is the culture. We've got to change from being a culture of, oh, well, we breed shorthorns, well, don't tell anyone though, to where we step out like some of the Angus breeders and we're a winning culture. And if you ever wanted to be in any country in the world where culture is dominant, this is the country, I'll tell you. Now, those who follow Rugby Union will have heard of the All Blacks, the local team. The All Blacks are the number one team in the world, population of four and a bit million, the number one team in the world. The All Blacks, a game of Rugby Union runs for 80 minutes. The All Blacks play it for 79 minutes, 64 seconds. Everyone else plays it for 70 and hope they can last the last 10. They run on the paddock expecting to win. We don't run onto the paddock expecting to win with our breed and that's the th core thing we've got to change with our cattle, with, it, with our shorthorn cattle and our people. We've got to turn them into dreamers of the day. So how do we do that? That to a great extent is done through the power of the internet. Whether we like it or not and whatever you say about the internet, don't worry about it, it's here. I had a client the other day, a gentleman, 80 odd, and he was worried when he turned his computer on and he got on the internet, he might wreck the internet. And I said, well, it's designed to withstand a nuclear war, so don't worry about your computer. But we ignore it at our absolute peril. Now, up on the screen there, you can have a look at the country you, you've come from. These are the figures on internet usage that have gone from 2000 to 2012. Bearing in mind, the internet basically became a public utility around about 1994, 95. So there's been enormous jumps in, in internet usage. The, the one uh, lagging behind there is South Africa, which hasn't grown that much. But you look at some of the other countries, we've all taken it. The internet is part and parcel. Uh, Dame Jenny was saying this morning about in China, where they get on the, on the um, iPhones uh, and start ferreting out stuff. You know, 350 million people use an iPhone. Uh, just incredible. Uh, to me, one of the light bulb moments for me last year was with the Drover's Journal, which now goes to oh, just on a thousand people around the world. And, and looking at the, on the program I use called, is called MailChimp, and you can actually look behind it and see who opened it, how often they opened it and what they looked at, etc. And I don't know why, but I assumed incorrectly that because we're basically involved in primary production, we wouldn't be as speedy as real estate agents or whatever else on the use of iPhones. 61% of the people open the Drover's Journal on their iPhone. Now, I thought they would have gone to their computer, but they just, Sunday morning, they pick it up. It's interesting just on that on Sunday morning, why it's Sunday morning. Um, I had a phone call last year from this craggy old voice on the end of the phone rang me up and he said, I'm not happy. I said, oh, why not Drover's Journal? Oh God, here we go, because my, my problem is I type something and hit the send button before I read it. Um, and I said, what did I say? He said, no, it's not what you did, did what you said, it's what you did. And I said, well, what did I do? He said, I got it on Saturday night. And Sam, my wife and I were going somewhere early Sunday morning, so I'll blow it, I'll send it sun Saturday night, she'll be right. So I said, is that a problem? He said, of course it's a bloody problem. He said, that's why I'm ringing it. He said, because the wife and I, we get up on Sunday morning, he said, we go around the cattle, we get back about 10 o'clock, we put the kettle on, turn on the computer, and there's the drover's journal. He said, it arrives Saturday night, you buggered our Sunday. <laughs> so, so it's Sunday morning, it is, and I've got a, 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 a subscriber in Montana, God bless him. Uh, he's one of the first people to read it, so it's about one o'clock in the morning, I think, in Montana when it hits his computer. So anyway, I'll have a rum or two with him one day talking about it. But as you can see, the internet usage, is, is, it runs our life. It absolutely runs our life. And yet we ignore it at our peril and I don't think we do a very good job on it collectively. So let's get onto that first of all, the key ingredients for the uh, utilising the internet for the short on breed. There are three parts, there are websites, email and video. That's the end of the exercise, the websites. All right, so the websites then are split up between shorthorn uh, breeds, associations, societies and individual members. And I probably spend, I don't know, seven to ten hours a week trolling shorthorn websites around the world, especially from November through to March because not a lot's happening in the shorthorn business in Australia in that time because we're on Christmas holidays or whatever else. And I've got to say, by and large, they're atrocious. They really are. Um, and when it comes to individual members of the above, 
I'm honestly stunned, and my other role is, is a livestock auctioneer, I'm absolutely stunned how few stud breeders have their, either their own website or, as I'll talk about later, on their database. You know, fellas, ladies, unless, unless you're in the game, you're not going anywhere. And I don't know what the figures are, I'm not even sure what the figures are in Australia, but very few studs have their own website. If they do have their own website, as I looked at one the other day, and it was on the front of the home page, it said last updated November 2009. So what's that say to me as someone who's looking at the website? Yeah, basically the bloke couldn't give a rat's ass about it. He's, he's got it on there because he meant to have a website. But the, this is a prime marketing tool to us, a prime marketing tool, be it breed societies or, uh, or individual studs. So for goodness sake, you know, look at it, look at it closely. So what are the critical features of a website? And there are three of them. What's in it for them? You know, what is in it for someone who's looking at the website? All too often websites are designed with what I call the blue suit complex. It's like wearing a blue suit and wetting your pants. It gives you a warm feeling but no one notices. And, and too many websites are designed for the website owner, not the person who's accessing it. And they've got to be simple to navigate. You know, it's, it's a critical part of it. And I've got to say, the majority of Shorthorn sites, you know, Christopher Columbus couldn't find his way, although he didn't know where he was going when he got there anyway. But the um, majority of sites are extraordinarily hard to navigate. They really are. Um, and they're current and kept up to date, as I said about the, um, the fellow stud that was last updated in 2009. Uh, this is critical that you update it. And it, they, a website is not an expensive exercise. It can be, it can be all the bells and whistles, but one of the problems that uh, we've got in Australia, which the NBN may well, the National Broadband Network that's supposedly coming in, and my mate in Montana's got, is you've got slow download speeds because you're at the end of the line, so I accept that. But having said that, if, if a lot of your clients have got the slow updates, make your website less complicated. But have it there and have it and make it about people. You know, one of the things I learnt with the Drover's Journal, which I originally formed to, as the breed magazine for Santa Gertrudis, um, and fellas would get stuck into me because I'd put a photo in there of three or four people on the head of the bull that someone's just paid 30000 for a bull. And the f stud master got all excited and upset because the bull wasn't in there. And I'd say, but I've never seen a bull buy a copy of the magazine yet. <laughs> you know, you'll put a paddock of short on bulls and cows together and they're going to do what they're going to do, which is punch out calves. It's the, it's the human comp comp component of it that is the critical part to it. So why don't we use photos more of people on there? Why don't we have stories of people more on our websites? You know, it's, it's just, to me it's logical because they're the ones who are going to make the decision and everyone, everyone wants to be loved. I don't care how crook you are, they, they want to be loved. And one of the things about us in the stud stock industry or pedigree stock industry is it wouldn't be unusual if I said to any of you, I saw your name or photo in a local paper in your country, in England, Canada, America, whatever, because that's our business of being in the paper. The average yogi doesn't get his name or her name in the paper or the photo in the paper. So if you said to someone oh, look, you know, I saw your photo in the Drover's Journal. The quietest person in the world will sneak off the toot by the end of the day, the toilet, and open up to see where his name's mentioned. That's how it operates. And we had a page in, when the Drover's Journal was done as a paper magazine called the Ladies' Page, and I'd take six or seven photos of ladies at whatever event I was at, and it was all done in pink and whatever. And it was nothing to sell 30 copies sometimes to a lady who'd been in, the, in that page because she wanted to send it to all her kids and grandkids and whatever else. So it's all about relating to people. So they're the three things you've got to be doing with it. With your email, email bulletins to members and interested groups. And Bert, I'm pleased to see with your, your latest one coming out. That's a good move, good move. Uh, and internal and external communication. Look, this is the critical part of it. The internet, we've talked about websites, but the biggest usage for the internet is really is emails at the moment, or texting if you can't spell. Um, isn't it atrocious? <laughs> hey? Unbelievable. We're, and I'll tell you how, how, this is getting off cattle, but how out of whack the world's getting. We advertised last year for a girl to become our receptionist. Yeah, not, not in the highest paid position in the country. And seven of the 11 turned up with their CV being Facebook. End of story. I said, beg your pardon? Oh, this, here's my Facebook page. I said, well, that's great, but what, what about the job? I know she said, that's my reference. Oh, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> anyway, 
So it's a whole educational process, and I think I'm speaking. I think it might have been Frank was saying earlier on today about the um, the younger people in in the UK. We've got to start tapping into them. And America, and the big youth market, Australia's got a big youth market. But e bulletins are absolutely critical to you. And I, I just don't, do not follow why pedigreed breeders don't have an ever expanding database. I really don't. There's absolutely no reason why. And if, don't give me all the bullshit about, oh, it's too complicated. Find someone that can do it. It's not hard to do. Because these are the people that supply the income to you. So why wouldn't you communicate with them? Now, I don't know. I don't know what the figures are in shorthorns in Australia. And likewise, I don't know overseas as well. But I would bet that the majority of breeders don't have an active database. I'll have a run with you later, Bert, and we'll talk about that. But why, why wouldn't you? Why is every time someone's bought a bull from you, why wouldn't you get their name, telephone number, their address and their email address? Now, I'm also involved in selling real estate property. So everyone that comes through an open house or a farm open, we have the name, telephone number and email database. And they get put on the list for the, the drover's journal equivalent is called the drum. And I've got nearly 3,000 people on that that get a, something from me every Tuesday morning. And that gets me a lot of business. So why wouldn't you people be doing that same thing to your stud clients? You know, Billy Bloggs from Wacka Wacka Rocka or wherever it is in New Zealand might only buy one bull every two years, but he's going to talk to someone else about someone else. And a great example of that sort of marketing goes back to the 1970s with, with Rick Pizzaturo. He had a bull called Mandalong Royal Ambassador, was one of the better bulls of the breed as you look at our breed's history in Australia. But that bull first appeared as a little calf's head sticking out of a lump of grass. It appeared in the old Pole Short on newsletter, and it was saying, this is going to be a champion bull, his name is Mandalong Royal Ambassador. End of story. When he, was, when he was three months old, there was another photo appeared. When he was six months old, 12 months, by the time that bull got to be in Sydney showering, it would have been someone who was gamer than Horatio Nelson to put him down the line. But he created the market for his bull. So why don't you people create the market for your cattle? You know, the digital photo. You know, Ian, Ian isn't it? Yeah, Ian and his wife come onto my stud property, so why wouldn't I take a, and buy a bull? Why wouldn't I take a photo of Ian? Where for your white pucker or some other like that, one of these places? That'll do, yeah. Like Wagga Wagga Wagga, mate. So why wouldn't I take a photo of you and your wife and put that on my database and send it to everybody saying that Ian and his wife had just bought a bull from me? Chances are that someone knows Ian, so Ian then t talks to them about, well, what do you think of Tony Fountain's cattle? Oh, mate, they were great. So what's that doing? It's promoting our breed. But uh, we have a bloody box full of cards or computer with hardly any names in it, and then sit around and bloody moan like Kilkenny cats about why business is crook. You know, make it happen for Christ's sake. Like a football, kick it. Have a go with it. Have a go, you mug. Sounds like the Australian cricket team. Geez, they're going well, aren't they? <laughs> oh, I tell you, my God, not many short ones in India, not many bloody good Australian cricketers either. <laughs> and they can't even blame Delhi Belly. They can't even see the ball. Anyway, that's another issue. <laughs> Another issue, an internal and external communication. So just put up on the screen that these are three of the examples we currently use. The two of them to the top and the bottom are to do with shorthorn beef and the middle ones that the drover's journal. So the one on the top right, that goes off to all the members of the shorthorn society. There's about 400 odd of them. So anytime anything happens, that goes out to them. The middle one is the drover's journal, which I send out every Sunday morning, which you just heard about why. And the far one, for those who are unfamiliar with it, in Australia and New Zealand, we have a, a pretty rare industry called the Stock and Station Agency, which is a combination um, of auctioneers, livestock selling people, etc., and, and rural property. It's all boxed into one industry called Stock and Station. Uh, and that one there is, uh, what's it called? Agents and shorthorns and agents. So anything time, anytime anything positive happens, and this is a very influential group, uh, because they, they're the ones that really get a lot of clients into Angus cattle. Because the, someone says, what short of bull would I buy? The agents don't want to argue with anybody. She says, may get a black one. <laughs> Boom, bang, bought an Angus bull when he should have bought a short one. So what we've done with that is that goes off at the moment to probably 20% of people it should be going to. We've got to pull our finger out and increase that database. And what I'm doing with that is also not only using it to promote short horns, but using it to promote the agent. So if you read one of these, it'll have on the bottom uh, that Deltroit sale was run by Landmark and Peter, someone or other, was the listing agent. So he then, same again, he then reads that. Chances are he'll forward that to a couple of his friends because he got himself on an email. Now, once we get agents coming back to us and doing that, um, you know, we're starting to move forward. So in your case in Canada and, and 
uh, in, in America, maybe this is something you'll be doing with your contract auctioneers, I don't know. And um, Frank, with the crowd that run at Sterling, um, your bull sale in Sterling, maybe it's worthwhile talking to them to see if you can get access, or not access, be able to send out an email to their database about what's happened with, with shorthorns in, in the UK. I mean, all these things are possible and you can create them overnight. We've got another one that we've, I haven't got up on there, which we're just sending off now to feedlotters. Uh, Shorthorns in Australia, and without preempting Richard's talk after me, probably thank me for this. Um, Shorthorns are having a very good run with feedlot competitions in Australia. So obviously, we need to be getting to feedlot operators the technical information on why they should be buying shorthorn blood. Now, at the moment, there's a premium in Australia for Angus beef over shorthorn beef, which is ridiculous. But if you want to sell to EU quality, there's no price between Angus and Shorthorn. So obviously we're trying to get our people into EU as well. But this is a prime means of dissemination of that, of that information. Video, and this is, where, this is where the future's gonna be, team. I'll tell you right now. Downloads in Australia tipped to rise by 500% by 2017, up from 86 million to 442 million. And we talk about youth. This is the part that's gonna capture your youth market where it gets put on, you know, ASA website or Shorthorn Beef website or whatever. Kids can download that 30 second clip or a minute and a half clip of them at a junior show at Missouri or Victoria or Alberta or wherever. That's the stuff that gets them in because they just, they literally just pull out the old iPhone, press the button and they watch themselves on a video. And that's, that's where it's coming to. Simple as that. Uh, and so then in America, people watching on mobiles or cell phones has grown by 205% and so over 10% of the population. That's 30 odd million people. Now I'd reckon, I don't know, another couple of years that's probably going to be 25 or 30% or more. So this is what we've got to be being able to, to produce. Uh, one of the things I'd love to see with our website in Australia is with the members section, where if you go into the members section now, it just has statistical data from ABRI. Boring as batshit. What we should have on there is segments in there where there are videos. If someone wants, if you want to become a member, why don't we, why don't we give them quality information? So why don't we have on that website and, and you know, maybe worthwhile you look at is, um, so the members click in with their membership number. They can either look breeding information through ABRI or other bodies. They can look at training videos. We all here know probably how roughly to teach a calf to lead. Uh, your point, Bert, was so many people aren't cattle owners in the traditional sense that are now part of your, your society. How many of them would know how to teach a calf to lead? Or simple things that we grew up knowing to do. So why don't we put a training video on there? You go into any technical product to see how to fly it, an iPhone or a, com or a printer or whatever, that company will have somewhere a short video that takes you through how to do it. So why don't we do the same? Now we can all go, oh, it's all bullshit, you know, we're getting too old for this, all that crap. We don't have that choice. We've either, you know, as my old man used to say, either piddle or get off the pot. Uh, and we're going to make this stuff happen. Um, it's how it goes and it's that, that content that's the critical part of it. And the key to all of that is data. Data is dollars, simple as that. There should be everyone, be it a stud breeder or a... Uh, or a organisation to have an ever-increasing database. The reason Amazon.com is worth squillions is not because they yet to make a decent profit, it's because they've probably got God knows how many millions of people on their database. So whoever bought Amazon, which is unlikely, they would pick up that database. And we need that every time you meet someone. You've got to be giving, swapping business cards, says he hardly brought any. Um, get their information, put them on the database, they get an email, thanks very much, put you on my database. It's as simple as that, it's cri absolutely critical. So how do we go about the data collection? Same way as we build membership, by working with states or divisions, uh, at bull sales, having that information. They just fill in their name and their, uh, the name and their uh, email address. Bang, they go on the database for your, for your uh, e-bulletins or whatever it may be. Notification of whatever's happened. Because see, the, the thing that controls all of this is a word called delete. The consumer now has the power. They don't like it, they go, hit the delete button, you're gone. Simple as that. So unless, and, and I honestly, with, with the Drover's Journal, I know when I've done something that went all right and something that was a gutter because I look at the, the hit rate and sometimes I've either got to be excited and said the wrong thing or um, it wasn't that much interest and people haven't clicked on it because every, everything I have on the Drover's Journal has a hyperlink, not everything, but sales, etc., have a hyperlink so you can look at that and if for some reason they haven't clicked on whatever the point was, then 
did I make the point well enough or was there just no interest in it? And you can do the same sort of testing yourselves and it's not hard, not hard to do at all. But we've got to be out all the time thinking data, thinking data, how do we collect data? How do we do it? And you, you might think an exercise at a local show just having some girls there or a couple of breeders there with a pad for people to fill in their name and, and um, email addresses is a waste of time. It's not a waste of time if you've got names because they're people who, where it is a waste of time is if you get the names you don't do anything with them. Then it's a complete waste of time. In short, we build our market share and I think that's, that to me is what it's all about. The two, the two issues I think confront and I, tomorrow I've got to give the final speech where now for short orders and I'm still working on that because I'm loving to talk to you people. But I think the two key issues we've got is change of culture and our market share. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're selling cattle, you're selling these little gadgets or motor cars, market share is what dictates your success. So unless it's going up, you're not going anywhere. Uh, all businesses do one or two things. They either grow or they shrink. They never sit still. And we've got to be aware of that. So data... data sh or market share is what we've really got to be doing and testing it and finding it. The internet's the major tool in that process and we ignore it at our, at our peril. We really do. We've just, we've just got to embrace it because unless we do that... And what I would ask you to do is, you know, go back and look at websites after, you know, when you get home to wherever it is. Go and spend a, a couple of hours on the internet and look up websites and look up short on websites and just see what you think and, and just use them as you would use them. Let's come back to my question. What's in it for them? We make them too difficult. Some of the sites are horrendous to try and get, I give up on them because you can't get the information out of it. For stud breeders over here, all your basic web page has got to be as a home page, which is, it's about us. It's your, invariably, it's a family history or whatever. It's got bulls that you got for sale, a bit of a story on your herd, what females you got for sale and how to contact me. So don't be shy about putting your email address on your website because that's, people, people don't, internet people don't have patience doesn't exist in them. They want to go boom, boom, and make it happen. So on your contact page, make that page easy to fill in. So either you click on the, on the email address and your email form on Outlook or whatever it is will open up and you can type away on it, or you fill in the form and send the thing. But then also have a segment in there and, and your internet provider or designer can do it for you for your video because this is a critical part of it. And one of the things that I hope to do before I go back tomorrow afternoon is do interviews with people um, on this iPhone which has been a revelation to me. I've just bought a little gadget and it sits on there. And we park that there and sit four feet away from it and do an interview. Um, if you just go on the internet and type in Tony Fountain, you'll see a heap of interviews that I've done on that, on real estate as well as cattle. That's how simple it is today. So there is no excuse not to be part of it. And if you find it all complicated, I'd say get out of it because you haven't got a future. Simple as that. We've either got to get up with it and run with it or get out. And... This breed has got such a future, such a future, if we handle it properly. Every, every box you tick for making a dollar or a peso or royale or whatever out of beef, shorthorns will do it for you. Trouble is, we tell ourselves, but we don't tell the world that well. Now let's change all that. That's hey, it. Yeah. Time's right. up. So. All right. All right. Well, thank Tony for his speech and I just main point I got out of was data is dollars, so yeah. I think that's most important. So yeah, no, it is. Simple as that. Just take a okay. uh, seat here for now, please. And, uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, six weeks moving into a stock feed company and it's a drought, so um, it's been pretty tough. So obviously UK's had it, we've been having it, so... Um, I don't really want to talk about um, selling feed at the moment. Uh, we're struggling a little bit, like uh, most of our suppliers are out there. Um, so, yep, so what I thought I'd do is just talk a little bit about me. Um, this is, uh, I live in Okaihau, which is a little town uh, about 40 minutes west of here with my wife and, um, and kids. And we've got a little lifestyle block there. My dad always reminds me it's probably more a life sentence block, more than a lifestyle block. Um, and uh, I guess for me, moving into this role, I've got a real passion for uh, uh, the industry. And um, so I thought what I'd do is share with you about where it all begins. And, and what we do at Ingham's is, is, is way more than just, just selling feed. We, we like to educate as well. So uh, I thought if uh, you wouldn't mind me running through 
our uh, carfaring presentation that we do with all our uh, our local stores and, our, and, our, and the guys we get to sit down in front of on dairy farms or calf rearing. And just as a little bit of a bit of a, a reminder, and um, I, I think just going back a little bit too, uh, listening to your um, your speech on getting information, it's something that we're we're always trying to do when we sit down with someone, grab their email address, their phone number, their address, so we can get a better understanding and and clear communication with our customers. So it's really important in in any industry. Okay, uh, just quickly a little bit about Ingham's uh, Feed and Nutrition. Um, we're a stock feed division of, of Ingham's Enterprises. Uh, virtually integrated business with investments in uh, poultry farming, processing, packaging and wholesale distribution across the Asia and Pacific region. Uh, our brands here in New Zealand are Top Cow, uh, our top calf range. We do a calf range uh, for, called Country Mole. It's um, exclusive to RD1 Limited. Uh, RD1 Limited is a rural retail outlet, 100% owned by Fonterra. Um, we've also got our Mitovite equine range and our uh, long acre which is our sort of our poultry um, and, and pig ranges that we, we do in the retail stores. Okay for me this is at the beginning so um, calf rearing is, is, is something that we're pretty passionate about um, so we, we'll just go through a few full bullet points to remind you and I'm, I'm probably teaching you all how to suck eggs which I don't want to do but um, uh, we all want to have excellent birth weights with our calves and um, driving here I thought well I'm going to be crucified because there's no short horn weight on there so um, I do apologise for that but I guess predominantly we're, we're targeting a lot of uh, Jersey and Frisian um, animals. Now all our calves uh, must receive that first colostrum. This is something that's a, it's a real good reminder for a lot of people. Uh, less two litres within the first six hours of birth and, and that first colostrum is that first colostrum. Um, and we've got some slides that we'll, we'll um, refer to very soon on that. Uh, navels should be nice and clean and dry using things like iodine um, and uh, good, good housing for them. 24-7 um, access, access to clean fresh water and uh, I've always been taught that if you wouldn't drink it yourself don't expect your animals to. Um, always have a source of low protein, high palatable hay um, and ad lib and uh, act quickly or first signs of illness and we always isolate. So remember, like us, well-fed calves are happy calves and uh, we all feel the same. So so we start at the beginning. Now Clostrum, I, I love this um, slide, it's a really, it's a really great reminder um, of what is actually in our Clostrum in, in that first 24 hour period. Um, and so that's what we talk about, that first um, colostrum. We want to take that off that cow um, and we got, want to get it into the calf and we want to store what we can. Uh, that's pretty much the immunity that will help it live. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really critical. And that wind of opportunity does reduce drastically over, over a 24 hour period and moving forward. So calves need 10% of their body weight as, um, as colostrum with the, within the first 12 hours of, of birth. Um, and uh, this will pretty much help with their immunisation um, and so I guess it's, it's pretty simple um, 35 kg animal should receive 3.5 litres of colostrum with the first 12 hours uh, one of the problems we face is 40% of our calves do not drink from their mums in the paddock um, so the latest theory is to collect the cows and calves twice a day, uh, which reduces the, the risk of health problems. So um, obviously the mother's not cleaning the calf, um, so we want to get in there and, and, uh, and get in there and clean those navels and, and give us some, something to drink. And also prevents the stress of animals um, with that natural bond. Um, so I guess we, we take the calves off and they go in the playpen with their mates and they're quite happy and, and because mum's been in the dry paddock I suppose and she goes off to the girls with the, uh, like all, oh, without being hit by anyone or throwing anything, they uh, quite enjoy food when they're a bit depressed so we put them in the, uh, in the high protein paddocks and they get a good feed. Um, so we collect that first colostrum uh, from the cow, tube feed the calf uh, in the rearing sheds and uh, keep this colostrum always separate from the second and upwards milkings. And this is just another um, bit of an example of that, that window of opportunity of survival if, if we're not uh, getting that first colostrum. It sort of diminishes pretty quickly. 
Okay, suitable housing, and um, it's really important, I think we can't stress enough, that, that fresh, clean water, nice, dry environment, hospital pens, good ventilation, and uh, one of the other things is the least amount of people getting in there, the, the better. Um, just keep your car freeways in there, no one else. So our basic systems, uh, this is something that we t tend to um, go over with, with our uh, retail teams just to, to let them know, to know how to get to know your customer and what they're doing so they understand the systems that, that people are using. So that conventional system was um, milk feed twice a day, four to six litres per calf per day, weaning of 10 to 12 weeks, typically on dairy farms with abundance of colostrum and whole milk available, uh, predominantly outdoor system with early access to pasture. Quite labour intensive because we're going through quite a few weeks of, of rearing. Uh, slower room and development, uh, which can lead to post weaning checking. So, a lower concentrated feed intake um, due to calves feeling fuller on milk. So, we and uh, early access to pasture. Um, a once a day system um, milk fed once a day, two to three litres a calf of milk. Um, which is a fortified milk or a, or a um, calf milk replacer. Uh, pallet towels, meal feeds, um, off lit, uh, ad lib from day one, and uh, physically effective fibre, uh, the source available, ad lib from day one. And look at weaning, five to six weeks of age. Uh, this is used in more uh, commercial rearers, mainly an indoor system uh, for the first six weeks. So less labour intensive uh, as you're getting them out on, on the grass a lot earlier. Um, you get an accelerated rumen development and uh, this certainly reduces those weaning checks and uh, calves prime for increased pasture consumption and you know with, with this being your replacements you want, want to get them out there eating as much as you possibly can from day one. Uh, high palletised consumption, um, always remember we, we've got to have careful management on that so just be mindful of, of um, acidosis and things in, in, in your rumen so it's always pays to uh, um, read how to, how to feed all your, your calves, what's on the bag. This is another one of my favourite little slides, um, I love pictures. Um, so rumen development, when you look at this it, it gives you a real good indication of, of the inside of our animals and I think in my industry and, and in your guys' interest, when you deal with animals, you, you want to know how they work. So we have a look at the insides, which reminds me there's a couple of slides in here if you're a bit squeamish. Um, we, we've got a couple of shots of rumen um, in there. Um, so when we look at the, the calf, you know, the abomasum is, is a heck of a lot bigger and the, the rumen is, is really un, undeveloped. Um, and so obviously in the, in the abomasum that's where your milk goes and, and so there's nothing going into, into the rumen so we want to get some development happening there. So the newborn calf rumen capacity is, is only 1 to 2 litres and it increases over 12 weeks to 25 to 30 litre capacity. Um, so solid feeds, example um, your meals, uh, that develops a rumen um, through ultimately, ultimately altering the, the volatile fatty acids um, and producing via starch fermentation. Um, so this is assisted by your physical effective fibre, which is like your, your pasture hay and your, your oat and hay. Um, what we want to do is we want to grow the papillae and the rumen. So that's the, the I guess, when the little, so that sort of fairy sort of um, outline or, or lining of, of, of the rumen wall, and we want to increase that. Um, so the earlier this process starts, the faster rumen develops and we can get things like the, them chewing their cud after a couple of weeks, uh, which is another really important thing, get that saliva going, and, and uh, which obviously has got a, um, a good uh, buffer with sodium bicarb, as it creates sodium bicarb. So it makes a good environment, really, for the, for the bugs to develop in their, in their rumen. Um, so continued high in, uh, milk intakes retards that rumen development, because it's actually not getting in there. Uh, so reasons for feeding hay, um, and this goes right through uh, into its adult years of, of having that um, effective fibre. Um, we want to get something that's more than two inches of length in there, um, so it promotes that chewing and st stimulates that salvation in saliva. So containing both uh, bicarb and phosphorus buffers, buffers which help maintain a uh, stable room and pH. So we want to breed those good bugs. Um, 
So your, your, your fibres provide um, some starch on the rumen wall, uh, which promotes muscular and, and uh, the rumen motility. So what happens, is, as you know, it's a big muscle around there and we just want to get it developing. And, and we've heard scratch factor, but it's more actually pushing something out there and activating that muscle to, to work. So it can move everything around there like a big washing machine and it, it forces stuff more out to the outside walls. Um, so we, we improve that and, um, and it moves everything out to the rumen wall and it pretty much gets better absorption um, and helps grow the, the propeller and gives you that good energy balance in there. Um, like I said, a um, couple of pictures. It's a full day hour rumen so she's pretty tiny and uh, we want to start start getting some development on there. So this is a, um, a shot of a, a rumen on that, on that milk phase. Um, so when calves are sucking, um, obviously that, that fold in the um, esophageal groove folds over and, and, and we miss, miss out getting anything in, into the rumen. Um, when we start adding um, some fibre in there, so that's a hay milk mix, we can see quite a significant increase um, and um, it, help, it really helps develop the rumen and muscularity. Um, but not vascularization, so it's the wrong volatile fatty acids that, are, that are, we've got going in there. So we need to put a bit more combination. So we, we, we poke a bit of grain in there, and after six weeks, um, this is a hay and grain feeding plus milk. The rumen, in, rumen is developing uh, both the muscularity and propellate size. And vasculation, seen, that's a darker colour, so that's pretty much a really good blood flow in there. And, and as you can see with it um, having a hell of a lot more um, propellate in there, it's a greater surface for everything to, to, to absorb. So that rumen development um, is the ratio of volatile fatty acids um, produced uh, which stimulate epithelial development, um, so it's not just a starch factor alone, and increased propionate and butyrate. So these are like your, your amino acids. Um, these are like the essential bits and pieces that, that kick us along. Um, and we need to create an environment that allows um, that good environment for our bugs. Um, so the epithelial development is the, is the dark in colour one which we, we showed. It's got improved vasculation and improves blood circulation, um, which has a direct stimulatory effect and uh, the nutrient absorption capacity. Uh, we add um, a few bits and pieces into to all the feeds that you, you're getting, and um, you know we talk about the, the pre and probiotics. Um, when I first of all read this, I was like, holy crap, this is just confusing the crap out of me. And, and they have quite a few scientific sort of ways of explaining things, but pretty much um, we want to remove things like E. coli and salmonella from our animals. And uh, the bacteria is always creeping around there trying to find something to hold on to. So we're going to pop some things in there that um, pretty much fills the hands of that bacteria so it's got nothing to grab hold of and it, and it pretty much passes through um, the animal and out the other end. And uh, so that's pretty much why we add, add your, your, your pre and probiotics in there. It sort of really helps um, eliminate uh, any bad bacteria floating around. Uh, choosing milk powders, a uh, minimum of 20% fat content, um, not from vegetable sources, so we, we want from our cows, um, and 24 to 28% protein uh, to provide essential amino acids and tissue muscular development. Uh, calcium and phosphate ratio has got to be 2 to 1. Uh, containing a coccidiostat, uh, especially important in the first 2 to weeks uh, when meal intake is low. Uh, and contains essential trace minerals and vitamins. Uh, group V, um, our calves need Group B. Uh, they're not really young enough, not old enough to actually produce it themselves. If cows get away with it, they can, they can uh, start producing that when they're a bit older. And obviously the uh, pre and probiotic to assist uh, in passengers' resistance. Um, such as E. coli and salmonella. I won't go into that, it's a bit of a detailed report on, on uh, milk powders. Okay, so amino acids, remember those, there are building blocks um, that really kick us along, um, builds our muscles, um, and I guess the um, amino acids absorb via the intestine and transport it around the body and the blood 
um, to de be deposited in the body as tissue. So they're, they're the building building blocks of, of getting a good sized animal. Um, so ingested in, in milk and, and meal and pre-ruminants, uh, once rumen is colonised with our, with our good bugs, around three to four weeks um, in systems with hay and meal, uh, the outflow of the rumen bugs become an additional source of amino acids. So when the when the bugs die or or pass what they've been eating, the cow uses, utilises that a lot as well. So I guess a bit of an overview. Um, good calf rearers address these key points: um, colostrum to feed correctly. So that's their first colostrum, um, and and that's your stored stuff. And well, well thought out calf rearing systems, um, room and development um, is pivotal uh, and, and we want to reach those early target weights as soon as we can. So quality feeds must be used every stage and we always talk about um, those physically effective fibres being available from day one and then uh, have a good weaning strategy. Um, so what to feed and when, and this is when I, I get to talk about our great feeds. Um, there's three basic types. We have a starter, which is more in a, um, I guess, a muesli type form. Um, and then we get a grower, which is around about 20% protein, and we finish them off with the 16% or, or drop into a bit less if they're, if they're checking and need a bit more. They've all got to be palatable, quality ingredients, um, and especially the amino acids and starch, and have a coccidiostat in there. So our starter feeds, which is our uh, Formula One, um, that's a pretty awesome product that we, we've got, uh, unique to uh, Ingham's. We've managed to um, get our molasses to actually soak into this product and keep it flowable. Um, and we've got these uh, Fabia beans that have come over from Australia and uh, they've got a really good starch factor in them. Um, Now 20% protein, again, uh, digestibility is good. How we, how we get good digestibility and what, and what we do, we, we go through a process of when we make these pellets, we, we cook them or heat them. Um, it not only locks in the nutrients value, I guess it's, it's, it's like if you get a bit of popcorn before you put it in the microwave, it's, it's quite hard to um, digest, but when you heat it up and it pops out, it, it's something that you, you, you digest it and absorb it really easily and that's the same sort of process and way of thinking that we we go through when we we make our products um, they're easy to be absorbed in, into the animal so they they get a, a really good benefit out of them uh, in our premium range we don't put any palm kernel um, and then we've got a 16 percent finisher um, again that can be fed all the way through on or off milk we do have um, a few budget feeds out there, specifically um, we did that Country Mile brand for um, RD1 and it's just being competitive, we've got to be competitive in these, in these markets so it will contain a little bit of PK in there um, and uh, always containing a Cox stat. We did pop in a, a bit of a caution. We had a um, evidently a few years ago had a, had a bit of an issue with, with someone feeding 20% um, protein all the way through. Uh, no physically effective fibre was available for these animals and uh, uh, had a major problem with, with acidosis. Um, and uh, so we, we always put in a, uh, I guess, a bit of a disclaimer in there. You know, if, if everything we put on the bag, we just encourage people to read. If you're unsure, get hold of your, uh, your local reps. And that was pretty much me, actually. I hope I didn't. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'd like to thank Mike for his address. Thank you, Mike, and a little bit of patience for you. Um, uh, Ingham Stock Foods has been one of our principal sponsors, so we'd pretty like to thank them for Chief Executive of Fonterra. And so there's changes in the wind for us farmers with with Fonterra. So I'll just hand over to Ben. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for having me. So uh, I have to say, if every work week started in the Bay of Islands, that would be, uh, that would be a major win for me. So thanks very much for the invite. Um, and as Ian said, um, I've been with Fonterra two years. Um, I have no connection to farming. Um, 
I don't quite want to say that I don't know what a shorthorn is. I've been here now for a few hours, so I'm, I'm getting a bit more progress. I've soon le certainly learned a lot about cow stomachs and, uh, and things like that. So I guess the, uh, the, the downside of that is that you know, I'm going to struggle to make the connection with, between uh, Fonterra strategy and, and shorthorn specific, but the, the upside is maybe um, I might have a bit more of a different perspective. So, um, and as, he, as Ian said, I guess my time at Fonterra has been characterised by um, being here at the same time as a new CEO, which has been a great, a great journey for me. My previous background was in uh, strategy consulting, um, and Fonterra is a, is a very exciting company to work for, and it's um, very exciting to work for, for a guy with such a clear vision for, uh, for dairy and for, for New Zealand's largest company. Okay, so uh, what I thought I'd talk about today... Um, Recognising also that there's a few people in the room that aren't from New Zealand, um, and obviously uh, there's a non-dairy component to Shorthorn. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about who is Fonterra, um, what we do and how big we are and where we are and where we play. And uh, very much from the position that I come from, you know, how Fonterra sees the world of dairy. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the opportunities and, um, and the landscape. And I see from the agenda Previously, you've had some interesting speakers um, who, from the few dot points here, it seems like they might have talked about China and Asia and places like that, so it'd be interesting to sort of compare notes. Um, bit of a pain I wasn't here to hear those, so hopefully I don't make too many contradictory statements. And then obviously, um, my, my aim is to kind of paint that picture of the world of dairy and hopefully describe a fairly rational and logical path to, towards Fonterra's priorities, um, so you can test me out on that one as well. And um, I guess unlike here, I guess we're going to have some questions later on, but I mean, I'm happy to have heckling or questions or whatever as we go along. I have questions. At the end? Okay, no problem. Okay, not a problem. All right, so who is Fonterra? Um, I guess the first thing to say is we're a farmer cooperative. We've got 10,500 farmers here in New Zealand. Um, so we, we exist to process, collect, process milk and do the best we can with it in terms of adding value to that milk. Um, as recently as uh, I think November, we, we did launch uh, a scheme called Trading Amongst Farmers, which was a, effectively a, a minor float of some, some of the economic rights to some of our shares. So the farmers still own 100%, but there is a, a very small fraction of, um, of shares um, whereby the, the dividend stream has been sold to outside investors. Um, so we actually now have a, a publicly traded stock price, if you like, on the NZX. Um, but still, by and large, well, absolutely 100% owned and controlled and very much existing for the New Zealand farmer. Um, Fonterra has existed for about a decade. We were the, the amalgam of a number of cooperatives in New Zealand. Um, and uh, we're obviously a very large part of New Zealand. You can't really go anywhere without seeing Fonterra in the paper or seeing some of our products. We're also part of a very important industry. Dairy makes up 26% of all New Zealand exports and I think Fonterra collects about 85% of all milk in New Zealand. So we are, are a big player. Um, but we're not just big in New Zealand and I guess that's a, that's a key point which may, maybe some people are also not aware. Fonterra is actually the largest dairy processor in the world. Um, and by far the largest player in terms of traded dairy. Obviously, with something like 5% of milk in New Zealand being consumed domestically, the vast majority is, is, um, is processed and, and dried predominantly and, and sent off overseas. Um, we have a global pr footprint. So you see here a, a map. And um, for those from this part of the world, you recognise brands like Tip Top and Mainland and, and, and Anchor. And some of those extend beyond New Zealand, so uh, Mainland is, is a big brand in Australia as well. And Anchor actually beyond that, we have, um, I think Anchor is the number one brand in Sri Lanka, um, as an example, and, and also big in the Caribbean and places like that. But beyond those kind of, those familiar brands, um, you know, we have a growing presence in, in Asia and in China. Uh, we have a, a brand called Anlean, which is about, um, it's a milk powder for predominantly women, um, middle-aged women. Uh, to to help bone density and and Anmum is a is a brand that we that's associated with 
products for pregnant women and also young infants in some markets. Um, in South America, uh, we have a big presence, actually. That's surprising even to people sometimes within Fonterra. Um, there's a company called Soprole in, in Chile, which is, which is the largest um, dairy company in Chile, and that's 100% owned by Fonterra. And we have a significant... Um, joint venture with Nestle in other parts of Latin America called Dairy Partners of America, which is a 50-50 JV, which has uh, significant operations in Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Venezuela, and, and Colombia. Those are our branded positions, but um, in addition to that, and actually predominantly, Fonterra is known as an ingredients um, processor. So um, the vast majority of what Fonterra does is dry milk, put it in bags, and sell it to people like Nestle around the world. Um, and we sell that pretty much literally everywhere in the world. So we have sales offices um, in Europe, in, in America, in other parts of Latin America, in, in North Africa, in the Middle East. Um, and that's, what, that's what's really the engine behind driving some of those, those key stats there. Um, so the other part that I wanted to talk about on this page was really about, uh, I guess, what we have, the, the, the glass-to-grass model, which is what we call about it, which is, which is unique in the sense that we, you know, we obviously have a very strong link with our farmers, so, um, and a key part of why Fonterra, Fonterra is successful is the, is the great um, the image and the quality and the, and the high-quality product that, that comes out of New Zealand. Um, we then obviously collect that milk, we process that milk, um, we sell it to, to other people, or sometimes we put brands on it. Um, and even in, in the retail space, obviously, we've heard earlier today, we have stores like RD1. So we're really playing right, right across the value chain in that, in that glass-to-grass model. The world of dairy. So, um, again, don't want to tell you how to suck eggs here, but I did notice some, from the previous slide today which countries you guys are from, and um, largely, I guess, Anglo-Saxon, with the exception of of uh, Argentina, by the looks of it, and maybe a little bit of South Africa. And I guess the products that, when you think about dairy, you think about, at least in a New Zealand context, some familiar things like fresh milk and yogurt and cheese and maybe soft cheeses. But at least from a Fonterra perspective, that's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. Dairy is consumed in lots of weird and wonderful ways around the world. Um, you can see some of the ones I put on the slide there. In Africa, um, you know, where people have a small amount of money, um, milk powder is bought in, big, bought in bulk and then divvied up into milk powder pouches or even very, very small sachets there. Um, in India, we obviously have, we have ghee, which is a, kind of a highly concentrated dairy fat product. Um, I was lucky enough recently to go to South America and spent some chi time in Chile and, and Brazil. And um, I guess just as a consumer going into the supermarket and looking at the dairy aisle, was quite, a, quite an eye-opener for me in terms of the way that people consume dairy. Um, fresh milk was kind of an oddity. It was very much about drinking UHT. And a um, and huge amount of space in the dairy cabinet for all, all sorts of weird and wonderful dairy desserts, which was a big part of the culture over there. Um, and obviously UHT, as I mentioned, and again, um, as an example in China, the, that product up on the top right there is called something like super pulpy milky or super milky pulpy or something. It's a um, milky juice, which, uh, which I think Coke manufactures and, and um, Fonterra provides the ingredients for. Sounds disgusting, but um, you know, that's how people in different parts of the world consume dairy, and that's, what, that's, the, that's the picture, I guess, that Fonterra is looking to participate in. Aside from the product, um, well, the key point there is, is variety. Um, you know, Fonterra is very excited about the, the outlook for dairy. Um, this chart here, the way you look at that, obviously, is the, the green bar is, is forecast demand for dairy, dairy ingredients, and the blue bar is, is forecast supply. So uh, what you see in, in that picture is um, you see a sort of a developed market and a versus emerging market story. Um, huge green bars in China, in India, and in Southeast Asia, um, and, and, and still pretty big in the Middle East, in North Africa, and even in Latin America, and that might surprise some people, it's only at 2% there, that's clouding some, some big numbers in, in some markets. Um, 
in contrast to you know, less than 1% growth in Europe, less than 1% growth in North America, 1% growth in, in this part of the world. You know, in, in these developed, mature, traditional dairy markets, you know, people, there's only so much dairy people can eat. Um, and you know, growth, fundamental GDP growth you know, at a certain level as well. Um, so that's fairly stable. But it's in these other markets that, um, you know, that that's really truly exciting. And the other dimension to this is, is that the blue numbers, the, the supply numbers in those markets aren't as high. They're high, but they're, they're not as high. Um, they're just not traditional dairy growing regions. Um, and that presents an opportunity. It presents an opportunity um, for, for people in this part of the world or in other dairy, dairy markets to shift their production away from supplying domestically towards towards export. And we've already seen that. This is the outlook to 2020, but we've already seen that within Fonterra in quite dramatic fashion over the last five or ten years. You know, it used to be the case, I guess, back in the mid-20th century when New Zealand was Britain's little farm, that, um, you know, we kind of had to stuff every little bit of dairy product that we could into the home markets. Um, and, and even more recently, you know, um, the US and places like that, very important markets. But with the rise of China and the rise of Asia more generally, um, which have typically been more open markets, um, you know, we've got a lot more places to put product and that has meant a quite substantial shift away from these, uh, these other places. So that's exciting for, for countries like New Zealand and it's exciting for companies like Fonterra that get to participate in that. Um, New Zealand and Fonterra and this part of the world has, has a strong reputation for, for making good quality quality ingredients and that's what people are looking for. Um, so the next slide was really just unpicking what's driving some of that stuff and, and potentially you've heard some of these things before but um, I mean it's important to understand these things aren't going away, this is not a, this is not a, a short term trend. The rise of emerging markets, we've been seeing that for some time, um, that just simply drives volume, you know, as people get richer they want stuff, they want food, um, and that, that's, that's seen in, in the demand we've seen. But it also drives a shift in tastes. Um, as people in places like China get richer, or as part of China's development, people move to the cities, um, and they sort of develop city-dwelling type, type preferences. Uh, tastes also westernise. Um, people uh, become more interested in nutrition, more interested in protein, more interested in high quality protein, which, which dairy is part of that picture. All these things are positive trends for dairy in, in these parts of the world. Um, in the case of, uh, of China, again, I guess the other thing is as people are getting richer, and you know, we know about the one child policy, we've got richer people with small families looking to really look after their kids, so there's a huge boom in, in infant nutrition. Which is another which is another feature as well. Moving down the list, there you know, aging population. So that's something that we recognise in in the developed part of the world potentially, um, in, in this market or in places like Japan, um, but also in China. I mean, China is unique in the sense it's a developing, but also an aging population. And as populations age, again, the focus shifts towards nutrition, mobility, um, and dairy has a, a big role to play in. In, in, that, in that picture, in that solution. The last two I've got there, I guess, are uh, shifting away from the demand drivers and more to other features of demand. So, um, you know, environmental pressures, that's not going away. Climate change, increased focus on sustainability, on environmental footprint, on water access, water quality. These are things that, uh, that are real, that, that consumers are talking about, that, that our customers are talking about in terms of wanting to be able to then talk to their consumers about. Um, food pressures, you know, we've had um, in amongst the global financial crises, we've had various food spikes, um, which is sort of starting to indicate that we're tapping out, you know, the quick wins in terms of uh, cheap food resources. This is, has an impact on price. Um, generally a good, new, good news if you're, a, if you're a producer. And then the global connectedness point um, I guess illustrated by you know I had a phone call earlier this late last week with a, one of our colleagues in at Saprole in Chile and he's saying you know when's it going to rain 
in New Zealand, obviously he's, there's, there's, an, there's an empathy there with the, with the New Zealand situation, but it's also having an impact on his milk prices in Chile, right? Um, he's seeing commodity prices rising, and, and, and for, for our Saprole business, where we're not, a, we're not a cooperative, we're just buying milk, it's obviously impacting his cost of goods. So it's a very connected world. The more that trade increases, um, you know, droughts here or, or surpluses here or drops in demand here, they all have an impact, and that's, um, and that's driving sort of one commodity price around the world and, and often quite volatile prices. That's the macro trends. Here's, here's how that translates more into what we see, I guess, with our customers and, and, and consumers, um, the sort of things that they talk about. So from a customer's perspective, so when we're talking here about the major companies, you know, so like the Nestle's or the Cokes or, you know, our big customers in China, Food safety, right, particularly in those emerging markets. I mean, that's a really big, hot topic issue. Um, you know, there was well-publicised events a few years back associated with Fonterra around uh, melamine and, and infant formula. Um, you know, every day in China there's, there's a food scare. There was the horse meat recently in Europe. I mean, these things are real. So, um, but we see it within Fonterra as a, as a, as a point of difference in terms of um, being able to describe and own that that that, glip, that grass to glass chain, um, but that's a, that's a big um, a big factor. Food security also again, particularly from governments. You know they're interested in understanding um, if they can't necessarily feed themselves as a country, they want to make sure that they've got a stable partner that they can rely on. Um, so a lot of Fonterra's businesses is government is is, is business to government um, or business to business that's kind of got a government relationship as well. And then from a consumer perspective and also trans translating into kind of leading edge, you know, consumer companies, a really an increased focus on nutrition. You know, we've got obesity, uh, we've got the aging population point I talked about. There's, there's a real increased interest in understanding what good nutrition looks like and, and, and what, what's dairy's role in that. Dairy's actually got, a, you know, lots of good points. Um, I guess they've copped a bit of flack over the years and butter versus margarine, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, fundamentally dairy's got a real role to play in nutrition. And so we see that as a as a win. And then, you know, to match that previous point on the other slide, consumers' concerns about environmental footprint. Um, within Fonterra we talk about that as the licence to operate in this market at least. Um, you know, we've got to be seen to be credible and, and, and get ahead of the game on that on that as well. So that's how kind of Fonterra sees the world, I guess, in a very short set of slides. Um, hopefully, what I'm about to tell you makes sense in that context, which is um, what are Fonterra's priorities. So this is, this is the strategy that Teo rolled out about just over a year ago. Um, number one, um, you know, most of what we deliver to our shareholders is in the form of the milk price. Um, and the milk price is, is delivered really by getting our core operations running. You've probably, over the, the week or so you've been here, driven around the country, and every now and again seen a large Fonterra plant. You know, we have a lot of stainless steel around the place and we need to make sure we run that efficiently. Um, minimise downgrade product and, uh, and quality problems and get as much milk through that stuff as we can without having to put more plant on the ground. So that's a big, big driver for us. Number two is, is about growing our, what we call everyday dairy. So you think of as a normal consumer, you go into the supermarket, um, making sure that a decent amount that goes in your shopping trolley is dairy, it's everyday dairy. Um, if you go to a New Zealand supermarket, there's a large number of Fonterra products, we're a major player, um, and it, go to somewhere like Chile, and the, and the same can be said. In our other markets, we, you know, we have dominant positions in pockets, places like Sri Lanka, but in other, in other parts, we're just starting that journey, and we only have a few positions. So a big part of our strategy is about um, occupying um, more positions in that everyday consumer space in our key markets, which if you go back to the, you know, one of the early slides, is around China, it's around Asia, it's around Latin America, these growth emerging markets. Number three, I didn't talk earlier in terms of mega trends, but you know, um, time poor people or busyness. I mean, that's a that's a trend, right? That's actually something that a company is getting richer as as uh, countries become more urbanised and they become more westernised. People also have less time to do things, which means they tend to eat out more, which means that one of the key growth areas um, for dairy is in what we call food service. Um, 
And Fonterra's got a great food service business. Um, at one end of the spectrum, it's supplying people like McDonald's with sliced cheese. Um, that's actually the least interesting end. The more exciting end, there's um, you know, fantastic models. Um, in Asia, for instance, um, they've got an, there's a, the Asian bakery sector is a very fast growing, growing sector. So getting these new bakers to start using dairy products and making cakes and things like that. Um, and we also have a, you know, a number of chefs that work for Fonterra and working with, with restaurants and hotel chains on recipes and getting them using Fonterra product and getting, using dairy product. Number four, I guess, taps on that aging population theme and this, um, this great brand we've got in Anlene, which is about keeping people mobile. So um, Anlene is our consumer product, but we also have a, a business proposition. So we have um, lots of innovation going into specialist medical nutrition products. So when you go to hospital and you've, you know, you've, maybe you've got a bit of muscle wastage, you've got to have uh, tubes put into your stomach, you might be given dairy protein as part of that story and Fonterra provides some of those uh, some of those products which are quite exciting and obviously very high value. Then as we go down the list, um, you know, I talked briefly about infant nutrition, obviously that with the growth in those emerging markets that's a key application um, and New Zealand is seen as a natural home for that and Fonterra is seen as a natural party to that. We have a branded proposition in Anmum, but we also do a large amount of business with the, you know, the major multinational infant nutrition providers and increasingly some of the local players. And then the last one there, I guess, you know, if you go back to this picture um, and you look at the Australia and New Zealand region there um, and you think about the current drought as well, actually, which I appreciate as a, as a one year um, phenomena, but Whatever version of the truth you believe, you know, this part of the world can't supply the kind of growth that's going on in those other markets. Though that growth in those other markets creates opportunities for us because it means we can be more selective about putting our milk solids into the highest value regions, but we won't be able to participate to the fullest. So theme six of our strategy is about whoops, selectively participating in offshore milk, pool, milk pools, but only when it makes sense, and it makes sense when it helps um, provide or protect access for New Zealand product. So we, we export an incredible amount of whole milk powder into China. You know, if the Chinese government closed the border on New Zealand, we'd have a, we'd have a problem, right? So, um, so, you know, what can we do to help support that industry while well, putting in farms into China is part of that story. Um, we also do it when we want to have um, downstream positions. So we want to have consumer positions in market that require fresh milk or require really high quality milk, um, local milk. Um, and then lastly, it has to make money. So in a very small number of areas, we, we look at um, sort of farming in market. So that's Fonterra's business priorities, and, and hopefully you can see the linkage there to, to how we see the macro picture. I guess the other side is, is the, um, the non-business um, initiatives, which Fonterra is increasingly looking um, to get involved in, and, and these really are around reflecting what we stand for and also that license to operate point that I made before. So I've just called out a couple of examples here which um, will play to, or at least have resonance, I think, with the New Zealanders in the room and maybe less so, less so others. On the left and, and on top right there, we've got um, Fonterra Milk for Schools and our Kickstart Breakfast Program, and this is all about providing nutrition to young kids. So um, last year we launched Fonterra Milk for Schools, which is um, Fonterra's program to provide 180 mils, I think, of UHT milk to every kid in primary school in New Zealand um, for primary schools that want to participate. And this was on the back, really, of an observation that milk consumption was, was dropping in New Zealand and, uh, and our belief that milk is a very nutritious product and helps, um, will help kids with their learning as well. And we've, we've received a great response um, in the community for, for that initiative. And Kickstart Breakfast is much more specific, and it's our partnership with Sanitarium targeting um, breakfast as opposed to sort of a morning tea kind of pick-me-up, which is the other one, um, and only for, for very low decile skill, skill, schools. So it's really providing breakfast where it might otherwise not be provided. And then the living water one is, is actually um, something that was announced very recently, I think last week or maybe the week before, which is 
I guess, symptomatic of a broader topic where, where Fonterra is doing a lot of work and Fonterra's farmer shareholders are also doing a lot of work. Living Water specifically is our partnership with, with the Department of Conservation where Fonterra are putting out uh, $20 million, I think, over 10 years um, to address water quality issues in some specific water um, catchments. Um, and obviously that's part of a broader picture around um, you know, making sure we do the right thing by the environment and address some of the concerns that we hear in the community around um, not just making great products, but also in, in the way that we make them. So that's all I had. I think I've used up my time. Um, so no questions anyway. So yeah, I look forward to your questions later on and, and definitely feel free to ask anything you like. I'll, um, I'll either answer it or uh, I'll take it under advisement and get back to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.